Welcome to the uh, Water and Environment Task Force. Uh, we continue, unfortunately, to have to do this virtually, and I look forward to a time where we can actually get back together, and, and uh, hopefully it's back at Brown and Caldwell, and they host us, and, and uh, so I look forward to that time period. First, I want to start with uh, just a little story, you know, and, and over the last year and a half now, we've been doing these virtual uh, meetings, and one of the things I've brought up is during COVID especially, that the uh, consumption of alcohol has gone up in the United States like some stinking 40%. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty big deal out there. Uh, and so I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be good about this and uh, adopt a practice of no, no cocktails before five in the afternoon. And so every year we have a golf tournament up here, and Dave Reek was on the line, Chris Davenport. Uh, and so while they're up here at the cabin, I said, you know, my practice is because of COVID, and I don't want to become a, uh, more of an alcoholic than I already am, is that we start cocktails after five. They didn't like that at all, I'll tell you that. And so, Mark, if you go ahead and, and share your screen, Dave Requa uh, made up a sign for me that's now hanging in this cabin. And uh, <laughs> so now we all know that it's okay at the cabin that it's five o'clock somewhere. So anyhow, I thought, Thank you, Dave, for that nice gift, and, it, and it's in a prominent place now. So uh, today uh, we're going to focus on all things water in the Bay Area. We've got three of the water leaders uh, from the, the three districts that are within the East Bay leadership uh, realm or area, and that will address this group. Um, they're not going to have uh, presentations, PowerPoint, but it's going to be more of a, a dialogue and Dan McIntyre, uh, General Manager of Dublin San Ramon, is going to lead that uh, discussion. Before we started here a few moment, moments ago, I was, I was telling the others up at our cabin here in, in Plumas National Forest, um, there have been such big fires over the last two months. Uh, the Plumas National Forest is only a million acres, and three quarters of that have burned up. Um, and in fact, the state of California is a 100 million acres. 30 million of those acres are forest land. In the last three years, 20 million out of the 33 million acres of forest land has burnt up. And so one of the things I'm working on is introducing the idea of gasification, because there's a lot of biomass up here that is, you can't do anything with, it's not valuable, but it needs to leave the forest floor before areas can be replanted. And so Gasification is something that's a lot different than the old biomass projects that are incineration. So anyway, I'm working on that. Anybody who's interested in that topic, contact me afterwards. Turning to water, uh, I'm sure everybody is keeping um, advised on the current reservoir conditions are catastrophic. Shasta sitting at 25% full. It should be at 45 this time of year. Oroville's at 22%, uh, and it should be at 35%. Uh, Clifford, I looked up your total East Bay mud storage. Uh, you're at 57%. So that's 771,000 acre feet for 1.4 million people. I'm sure that's got your full attention. Uh, and um, Steve, in terms of Los Vaqueros, you're sitting at 73%, 118,000 acre feet, serving a half a million people. And Valerie, Zone 7, your request to the State Water Project this year, 81,000 acre feet. Their allocation to you was 4,000 acre feet. And so I know that's got uh, a lot of your attention there. So uh, before I turn it over to Dan, who will give us the upcoming meetings and then take over the meeting, uh, I just wanna set the stage as, uh, I, with the new leadership here uh, in the Bay Area uh, in water, you know, I, I am such a big fan of the 2017 report that came out from the Bay Area uh, uh, Regional Reliability Group, which you guys are all members of and leaders in that came up with 16 different ideas on how to enhance the Bay Area's water supplies in terms of reliability and sustainability. A lot of those, uh, several of those actions, 16 actions are in play. I looked down the list. There's seven different uh, transfer pipelines that are being in, in that are being studied around the Bay Area. Uh, and it's funny, the report says one of the long term uh, linkages out there would be between East Bay Mud and, and Marin Municipal. We all know Marin Municipal is about completely out of water, and so there's big discussions on putting that pipeline back on the San Rafael Bridge. But there's other uh, inner ties there between the projects. Los Vaqueros expansion, I see Marguerite on there, and Steve, you guys are, you're 
champions out there in terms of moving that project forward. And it sounds, based on what I know, it sounds very promising. Um, and then other near-term projects, the Walnut Creek uh, water treatment plant, uh, Silicon Valley water, ad advanced water. I know Santa Clara is not on the line. I don't think they are. They've got a lot of projects going on. Regional desal, uh, brackish desal is more, it's listed as a long-term. I would submit to this group that it could be much shorter term and that the Western Delta is ripe for a, a regional project for desalination. Um, and then finally, the Bay Area regional market, water market, you guys are doing a lot in terms of how can we exchange water around the Bay Area. I think that's fantastic. And so I really look forward to your leadership and hearing from you today. And so I'm, rather than me continue rambling, Dan, what are the upcoming meetings for our group? Dan, you're on mute. There you go. Great. Uh, so next month we have a special guest, the chair of the State Water Resources Control Board, uh, Joaquin Esquivel, who's going to come and be a guest speaker. Today we're talking about uh, agencies' uh, water uh, issues facing uh, our region, uh, and you'll get to hear the state level uh, perspective next month. Uh, in November, tentatively, we're scheduled for hearing how our measure AA dollars in, uh, in, in the Bay Area are being invested by the San Francisco uh, Restoration Authority for Marshlands Restoration. And our guest speaker for that is planned to be Jim Fielder, Field, Fiedler, who is a chair of the Citizens Oversight Committee. Uh, we'll be off in December. And then in January, we'll be looking at Chevron's energy transition plan. And that's a tentative. So lots of good things and other things in the hopper throughout 2022. If any of you have uh, ideas of things you'd like to submit, let any of the planning team members uh, like me or Gary or George know, uh, and we'll get those uh, in the queue. Great. So, so, um, hang on one second. Sorry, Dan. Kristen, do you have any announcements for the, the group? Just real quick, I uh, always want to thank our water agencies and wastewater agencies that are so engaged and supportive of our work. So I'm really looking forward to today's program. But um, there's also great works in the community that all of you engage in. So we've extended our deadline uh, through tomorrow by the end of the day if you want to submit philanthropy awards nominations. We'll go ahead and put the link in the chat. It's at the top of our webpage, um, and we try to make that really easy. So please uh, submit some nominations while you still have the chance and mark your calendar for Thursday, November 18th, which is when we'll be doing our 11th annual philanthropy awards breakfast. We hope you can join us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kristen. I see in participants, Dan, we're up to 55. So these three general managers are pulling in quite a quite a crowd and I look forward to it. Except rock stars. Oh, yeah. yeah, rock solid, thank you. Okay, uh, so yeah, I'm Dan McIntyre. I'm your moderator today. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Water and Environment Task Force. And our topic today is water agency general managers perspectives on near and long-term vision for the East Bay Water Agencies. Uh, there's a lot of issues that are in flux right now uh, that are facing the water agencies. You have the COVID crisis and how do water agencies sustain full operations during pandemic? You've got generational challenges that are, that are cropping up and maybe being accelerated by the whole COVID crisis where we're seeing you know, turnover in, in our agencies and having to figure out how to manage through that. There's climate change, uh, now we're in another you know, super drought, having to manage that. Um, there's these forever chemicals known as PFAS chemicals that are emerging as an issue and regulations are coming down on that. Big challenges for all the water agencies there. Uh, we have aging infrastructure that was built by previous generations. And now it's time for our generation to begin reinvesting in some of our infrastructure. And then there's the garden variety public safety power shutoffs. And there's probably a lot of other things. So a whole bunch of issues to choose from. Uh, it's always, you know, what's going to hit us next. Um, so uh, as the environment for uh, water agencies provides uh, the provide services uh, changes, uh, we have seen the passing of the baton in the major East Bay uh, water agencies. So our special guests are, are in a panel discussion. And there are three newest general managers of the water agencies in the East Bay. So I'd like to thank our three guests. Uh, firstly, uh, Valerie Pryor, longest tenured. She's general manager of Zone 7, and, is, and Zone 7 serves as the water wholesaler for the Tri-Valley and the Doherty Valley and Contra Costa, and she's been in her position since 2018. Uh, Steve Welch is second in seniority. He joins us from Contra Costa Water District, and he's been in his position, his current title since 2019, although he had many years with Contra Costa before that. 
And, and then our, our rookie or a person who's just finished his rookie season, uh, Clifford Chan, who's been general manager with East Bay Mud after many years in a variety of engineering and, and ops and management roles in East Bay Mud. So uh, our process is I'd like to ask each of these uh, three special guests uh, to give us an introduction, a little bit about themselves, their agencies, and, uh, and some issues that they're facing right now. Uh, then I'll throw out some moderator questions. Uh, then we'll open up the floor to general questions uh, after that. So I'd like to start off with allowing each of the three to introduce themselves uh, in order of seniority and uh, you know, to, to, to pick an arbitrary uh, method for how we're gonna do this and to spend you know, uh, five to eight minutes uh, introducing themselves or agency and what is their short-term and or long-term vision for their agency as the newest general manager for their shop. So Valerie, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Dan. Good morning, and thank you for having me here. So as Dan said, I'm the general manager of the Zone 7 Water Agency, and I've been here for about three and a half years. Prior to that, I was working for another water agency in Southern California. It was a long time Castaic Lake Water Agency, and as of 2018, became the Santa Cruz Valley Water Agency. And before that, I worked for the City of Los Angeles, both for the City Administrative Officer and the Department of Transportation. So Zone 7, as Dan mentioned, we are largely a water wholesaler and we serve the cities of Dublin, Livermore, Pleasanton, and parts of San Ramon. And we also sell direct untreated water to agricultural customers, about 15% of our water sales. Um, a large amount of that supports the Livermore Valley Wine Growing Agency. And then we are also a flood control agency. We operate about 40 miles of flood control channels in eastern Alameda County. And I guess Dan was asking me to talk about my near-term vision and my long-term vision. I think everybody's near-term vision right now is dealing with COVID and the drought. Um, COVID's been something new. Drought's something that water agencies deal with periodically, you know, every five to seven years. Uh, seems to be a little bit more frequent now. Um, but those are the challenges facing many water agencies, and I think we're all working through those. Um, a lot of collaboration and communication with other agencies. You know, as far as a long term, well, actually more on the zone seven and the short term um, vision, besides dealing with external factors uh, like drought and COVID, I think one of my focuses has been on communication and transparency, trying to increase the communications and transparency in the community and within the organization. And when I started in water almost 20 years ago, I think there was a generation of leadership that said like, oh, nobody needs to hear about the water agency. As long as they turn on their taps and the water comes out, they're happy. And I think that was fine 20 years ago, but I think as you know, we have growth, need to get more water, which is more expensive, have to deal with more frequent droughts. People are more aware of droughts. People have to deal with mandatory conservation. And so we get to a point where your water agency is in people's minds or the news more often. Um, and if you just react, you'll only be in the news. You'll only be out there when there's a drought or mandatory conservation. So I think, you know, telling the story of the Zone 7 Water Agency and the, the, the tasks we do and the services we provide to the community is helpful. As far as long-term vision, I think it's continuing to build a resilient water supply portfolio and a future of decreasing water supply reliability. Zone 7 is a state water project contractor. About 70% of our water is imported from the state water project, and that is becoming less reliable over time. And also we still have about 20% more development to go before we're out build out. So for those reasons, we need to pursue a number of projects for water supply and water supply reliability. Um, working with many of the agencies in the Bay Area on that, we're involved in Los Vaqueros Reservoir expansion, looking at a brackish desal plant, our local partners looking at potable reuse, and we're also participating and pursuing in the Delta Conveyance Project and the Sites Reservoir, which is a statewide project. And then lastly, on the long-term uh, vision for me is for Zone 7 is completing a flood management plan. We currently have a 2006 stream management master plan. It's obviously 15 years old on paper, but a lot of the work and the data is from 20 years ago. So we would like to take a fresh new look at our flood management plan in, in light of you know, changing regulatory environment and climate change. We've really just kicked that off and that will be about a two to three year project, um, but we're looking at a focus, you know, streamlined, you know, climate change savvy, modern flood management plan. So 
that in a nutshell is my short and long-term vision for the agency. Okay, cool, Valerie. Uh, I'll look forward to uh, hitting some of the questions and delving into a couple of those issues in greater detail. So, uh, Steve, you're up next. What's up with you and Contra Costa Water District? What's what's your introduction and and uh, what are some of the uh, long-term and, and short-term vision for you at CCWD? Great, thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, yeah, I'm a, a longtime resident of Contra Costa County. My family's been here for about 200 years. Um, and uh, uh, I'm a three-time UC Berkeley grad, go Bears. Uh, my career started, uh, I worked for a consultant for a couple of years and then East Bay Mud for six years. And I've been at Contra Costa Water District for 26 years. So I think I know the Water District pretty well. Um, and, you know, uh, what, what one thing I really enjoy about working at Contra Costa Water District is just the fact that we're serving our community and you know the place where you live is the place where you're serving to um, build uh, reliable water service for our customers. So um, some of the, uh, uh, well, a little bit about Contra Costa Water District, for those that don't know, we get almost all of our water from the Delta. Um, it's our essentially our sole water supply. So we're very in tune with the Delta. We've been a long time leader in that area for those reasons. Uh, we have about 500,000 customers. We serve both untreated water uh, to several municipalities and some large industries, as well as treated water. We have a treated water service area uh, with uh, between a uh, little around 65,000 accounts, a little more than that. Um, so uh, the, the near-term issues that we've been working on right now, uh, this you'll probably hear this from many, is COVID and the drought. I think those are the two uh, um, strongest near-term issues. We also have our retirement program is quite strong and stable, but we do have a few little tweaks we need to do to make that a much more sustainable retirement system. So we're working on that here in the near term. Uh, we're in contract negotiations right now. And uh, so that's a, also a near term focus is to get uh, some good labor stability moving forward. Uh, long term, I mean, you're going to hear the same thing. And I think that's why maybe a few people have tuned in today is, is water supply reliability. Um, that's that's something that uh, all of us are constantly working at. Unfortunately, my predecessors and our board of directors here did a really good job of, of you know, looking and, and uh, uh, working on that need over 20 years ago. And so we do have pretty good reliability here, but we can do more. And related to that, one of the projects I already mentioned, Los Vaqueros expansion, which I'll talk about a little bit more, is a key focus for us, uh, not only for the fact that it provides reliability for uh, more of the Bay Area, and I think will provide the flexibility that can help us weather through tough times like this year uh, with the drought. But also for us, it provides a little bit more financial flexibility. And so that feeds into the number two uh, long-term focus for Contra Costa Water District is infrastructure renewal. We have some significant um, assets that are coming to the end of their useful live, lives uh, and we'll need hundreds of millions of dollars of reinvestment and um, not only from our rates, which we've planned for in the previously to help for that renewal and replacement, but the Los Vaqueros project gives us a little bit of financial flexibility to leverage, if you will, some of our fixed assets better so that we can um, uh, use those investments to leverage new investments. So um, that's the, probably the second key area of focus for Contra Costa Water in the long term. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Clifford, or to you, back to you, Dan, to hand to Clifford. Okay, uh, Steve, a, a lot of issues uh, facing your agency. Um, so with that, let's turn it over to Clifford. And if you would share with us, Clifford, an introduction to you. I know you uh, introduced yourself to the Water and Environment Task Force about a year ago, but uh, there's probably some new people here today. So go ahead and reintroduce yourself and, uh, and then share your short and long-term vision for East Bay Mud. Well, uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, good morning, everyone. And um, uh, thanks for having all of us on the panel. It's great to be the, the rookie on this panel here and, uh, and difficult to follow Valerie and Steve. Um, so let me start uh, and tell you a little bit about myself. Um, uh, I was born in the East Bay. Um, I've lived here my entire life. I don't know if I can, maybe comparable to Steve, um, but uh, I'm a sixth generation Californian, uh, Chinese American. Um, our family settled here uh, in the Monterey area in Pacific Grove. So um, 
Uh, if you don't know exactly that area, if you know the Monterey Bay Aquarium and you're looking straight at it, if you look to your left, um, that's the Hopkins Marine Station. That used to be a Chinese fishing village and, and that's where our family um, settled uh, back in the 1800s. Um, my father was a, a history professor. He taught Chinese history and uh, US history. Um, first in his family to go to college. Um, I have to say my mother probably had the harder job and she had to take care of all the kids at home. Um, I have one brother and uh, two sisters. Um, uh, Steve, you know, go Bears, um, all of us, my dad, um, I, my brother, my two sisters, we all went to Cal. Um, uh, I got my undergraduate and graduate degrees in civil engineering uh, from Berkeley. Um, I met my wife um, at Berkeley. Um, you know, while at Berkeley, I was, um, I ran a tutorial program um, in Chinatown to help children that lived in low income, um, uh, you know, with families uh, in low income families. Um, and, uh, you know, that's how I met my family, uh, my wife and, um, you know, and, you know, you know, we have uh, two boys. Um, I just dropped off my youngest boy to college. Um, uh, first time away from home. It was, um, I didn't think I would be so emotional, but I was quite emotional dropping him off. So that, that was, um, that was difficult. Um, uh, they're both in college now, um, but you know, much to my chagrin, uh, neither of them have chose uh, or show, showed any interest in engineering. Um, but uh, I, you know, I've gotten over that um, already. Uh, let's see, uh, before coming to East Bay Mud, I worked in consulting. Um, I see Ann Spaulding on the call and um, Ann Spaulding and I were at the same consulting firm. Um, and then I've been general manager, like you said, Dan, I mean, it's been um, just since last June. So, you know, a bit over a year. Um, I have to say it's a great time to start as general manager at the beginning of a pandemic. So I you know, really recommend that to, to anyone to, um, Really kind of jump in and, and get your get you know you know get your juices going. Um, but I've been in East Bay Mud for 24 years, um, so I'm not new to East Bay Mud. Um, first four years, I've been in the engineering department, um, but I spent most of my career here at East Bay Mud um, in the operations and maintenance department. Um, so a little bit about East Bay Mud. I um, have to be careful um, uh, because Bob Maddow is on the call, and he'll probably correct me on the history of East Bay Mud. Um, but if I'm uh, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm wrong, Bob, um, you know, just spare, spare me from correcting my, my history. Um, but, you know, some of you may know the history of um, water in East Bay. Um, but for those of you that don't, you know, East Bay mud was formed almost a hundred years ago. Um, but you actually have to go back 60 years before that in the 1860s, uh, when Anthony Chabot started the Contra Costa Water Company. Um, not to be confused with the Contra Costa Water District, two separate entities. Um, Chabot, he built Lake Temescal. Uh, he built Lake Chabot. Um, you may have visited those, uh, those reservoirs, taking hikes around the area. Um, Chabot Space and Science Center, um, Chabot College, you're both named um, in honor of Chabot. Uh, the Contra Costa Water Company eventually became the People's Water Company. Um, the People's Water Company run, run by Frank C. Havens. Um, that name may not be familiar to you, but Frank C. Havens was a developer behind the Claremont Hotel. Um, you can also blame Frank C. Havens for all the eucalyptus trees in the Berkeley and Oakland Hills. Um, he planted about one to three million eucalyptus seedlings. Um, and growing up, um, you know, and of course I didn't know this at the time, but I actually went to Frank C. Havens Elementary School. Um, didn't know the connection, but that's, that's a little bit of my history. Now the People's Water Company, eventually became the East Bay Water Company, and that's not to be confused with um, East Bay Mud. Um, but those you know, larger water companies, um, and there are actually dozens of other smaller water companies in East Bay, they all failed um, in large part um, because they couldn't provide a reliable water supply or provide high quality water or keep water affordable. So back in 1921, the California legislature passed the Municipal Utility District Act um, and, uh, you know, for the MUD Act. And in 1923, the people of East Bay voted to form East Bay MUD. So today we serve um, over 1.4 million customers in 35 cities and communities uh, and provide wastewater service to 740,000 customers. Um, we have hundreds of facilities. We have over 4,200 miles of pipe. Um, and we haven't forgotten, you know, why we were formed. Um, and that's reflected in our mission and everything that we do. Um, so kind of getting to my near and long-term vision, um, you know, there are a lot of challenges um, that we in the water industry are dealing with. Um, I don't know um, if it's appropriate to call a near-term vision, um, but, you know, I'm just going to repeat a little bit of what Steve and Valerie said. Um, yeah, my immediate focus is on dealing with the drought. 
um, on navigating our way out of the pandemic um, and also helping our customers um, who are still struggling with paying their bills, whether it's due to the COVID or even before then. Um, when I think about our long-term or my long-term vision, you know, I have to look back at our history. Um, we inherited, I think as Dan said, much of our infrastructure um, from all the other water companies that uh, were in the East Bay. And much of that infrastructure is still in service today. Um, so part of my longer term vision is really a continuation of what all the other general managers have focused on, um, which is our infrastructure. Um, but for me, the focus isn't just about renewing the infrastructure, it's about how we can make that infrastructure more sustainable and more resilient. Um, I'm also focused on water affordability. Um, uh, and then there's also our efforts to address climate change. You heard Valerie and Steve talk about that, and that's both mitigating the effects of climate change and adapting to it. You know, we're already seeing the impacts of climate change on our water supply reliability, on droughts, on sea level rise, wildfires, and algal blooms. You know, if you look at the latest IPCC report, you know, some of the more severe impacts are predicted uh, to happen in 2050. And like I said, you know, my youngest son was born in 2001. He'll be 49 in 2050. So this isn't some far away problem anymore. You know, this is something that we have to start addressing today. Um, and finally, I'm, I'm focused on protecting um, the environment and the San Francisco Bay, uh, research and innovation, uh, and developing our workforce and attracting our future workforce. Um, so really kind of to sum it up, you know, that long-term vision is really about how can we be more resilient and sustainable in everything we do, whether it's water supply, infrastructure, finances, and, our, and people, all to support the community we serve. Great, Clifford, and uh, I loved uh, a lot of the personalized touches and the, you know, how you set some of the context with some of the family uh, history. So next, I'd like to dive into some questions that I have, and we'll see how that goes, and then we'll open up the floor. Uh, we're on a good pace right now, so uh, we're doing well. So for the three panelists, and you can answer in whatever order you'd like, um, what changes in direction do you see for your agency during your tenure? Is there any one big thing you'd like to accomplish or advance? And while you ponder that, remember, all of your predecessors are in this conference call watching you to hear what you say about them. So uh, go ahead and, and uh, share your thoughts on, uh, on changes in direction or, or course correction or adaptations, evolution, if you will. And is there any one big thing you can identify? Hi, Dan, I, I can start out. And you did not tell me I was going to be outnumbered by UC Berkeley people. So uh, next time, let's have a little bit more balance on the panel. I'm a two-time UCLA grad, so go Bruins. I think you know the biggest change that I would associate with my tenure is what I mentioned earlier, but it's the increased uh, communications and transparency and outreach, You know, really being out there more for the community. Um, you know, educating them on the Zone 7 Water Agency and what services we provide and trying to get them more aware of, you know, water issues or flood issues. So I think that's the biggest change in direction I'm providing. I think, you know, in this day and age, a lot of what we deal with in, in water agencies is we, we adapt to, you know, the external environment. So it's not like somebody said, oh, I want to go be a water agency and I want to work through a pandemic or I want to go work at a water agency and work through a drought. Um, so new regulations, new situations, you know, we just, we have to deal with those. So for me, I think my biggest focus, my biggest change is on the outreach and transparency. And then the one big thing I'd, you know, like to accomplish, which I mentioned earlier, is our flood management plan. Um, a lot of what we deal with in, in water is, so much of water is in one way or another regulated by other agencies, you know, the rules about your water supply, the contracts you have, the rules on who can run a water treatment plant, the rules on water quality and testing, the rules on how you charge and calculate your rates. But with the flood system, there's a lot less direction. So um, I think getting the Zone 7 Water Agency and the board and the employees and the community focused on what our, our plan will be for the, the future, I think that's one of my big accomplishments if I can pull that off. Maybe I can go next and, and Valerie, you know, nothing against UCLA. So, you know, go Bruins too. <laughs> and I, I saw somebody drop in a comment. I think you're in good company. Um, but, you know, I, I think when we talk about, um, you know, changes in direction and, and Dan, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of um, 
our, our, our you know, former East Bay Mud employees and current East Bay Mud employees are here. So, um, you know, we do have to um, remember that we, we've been doing a lot of great things over the decades. Um, so when we talk about changes in direction, you know, we have to put that in perspective. You know, I don't want to imply that there's some you know, big problem um, that we're trying to fix um, with what we've been doing in the past. Um, but I would say, you know, if the pandemic or the current drought really has highlighted anything, um, is that um, we need to look at you know, how we can be more resilient um, and how we can do things differently uh, and really do things differently in everything that we do. Um, so for example, you know, it's not enough just to have um, a sustainable pipeline replacement program. You know, you don't wanna just say, I wanna replace all my pipes every hundred years. You have to make sure that the pipes you replace are resilient and we think of it as a system. Now, when you think about the treatment plants and you know, Valerie touched on this a bit, um, you know, how can we make sure that our treatment plant upgrades um, can handle greater variability in our source water quality, uh, whether it's due to the wildfires um, in our watershed or new emerging contaminants? Um, you know, how can we make sure our water supply is diversified enough to handle extreme droughts? Um, and then also our workforce, you know, how can we be more flexible with our workforce? You know, if you go back to last March, just before the pandemic, and if you ask any general manager, you know, would you, um, allow a large part of your workforce to work 100% from home or nearly 100% from home, I will guarantee you that most of them would have said, no, we wouldn't do that. Um, and even if they're willing, you know, they, you know, they would have put a plan together that would take a year or two to roll out. Um, but, you know, what the pandemic did was, um, you know, we, we all shifted quickly. You know, within a week or two, we all, you know, started working from home. It wasn't perfect. Um, but I think what we learned is, you know, let's not make perfect be the enemy of good. Um, you know, and as far as a big thing, one big thing, I don't, you know, I can't narrow it down to maybe one big thing, but just a few big things um, that I'd like to accomplish. And what you'll hear, I think, from Steve and from Valerie um, is greater collaboration. Um, and that greater collaboration is going to help us solve our problems. You know, we have these enormous challenges and we can really only solve these problems uh, by collaborating. We can't, we learn, we can't do these on our own anymore. We really have to work together. Uh, the second big thing is investing in innovation. You know, we've partnered here at East Bay Mud with UC Berkeley to create a center focused on innovation. Um, you know, these are the challenges, um, you know, are really going to require us not just to collaborate with other water agencies. We have to collaborate with academia. We have to collaborate with regulators. We have to collaborate with vendors. Um, we have to do that. We have to innovate uh, in order to address our big problems. Um, and that one of the things we can do is leverage all the data we have. We have a ton of data that can help us make better capital decisions, better operating and maintenance decisions. Um, and then the last big thing I would say is working on attracting the best and the brightest. You know, our next generation of employees um, are really going to have to be a more diverse uh, group of employees. Um, they're going to bring in new ideas into our organization. We're all seeing a retirement bubble that we're gonna to have to work our way through. Um, and we're gonna to have to adapt to that new generation and how they do things. Um, and I think you know, that's an exciting part. We want people to be excited about coming into and working with, uh, with water industry. Okay, well, I'll, I'll wrap up this uh, question. So I wouldn't say that I've really implemented any changes uh, to uh, Contra Costa Water's direction, but some areas that I've refocused us or, or actually I'll say emphasized stronger. Um, and uh, I think a lot of agencies are facing this in, in the spring. Not only did we have COVID that uh, provided us a shock in, in this country, but then we had some civil unrest that also occurred in that same year in the spring. And it really, uh, for me, uh, and we had already been starting to work on it, but for me really highlighted that diversity and inclusion or diversity equity and inclusion is an area that we could do more in. And uh, it's become a strong focus for Contra Costa Water District here. Uh, we've invested a, a significant amount of resources, not only staff that are committed to this uh, effort, but also the entire workforce in working on this. And, and as we've seen, and I think uh, those, of us that are leading through COVID right now are finding out that there are differing opinions about how the COVID response should be implemented. There's differing opinions about how diversity and equity should be 
addressed in, in the workplace. And, uh, you know, it's going to take time to have conversations and, and have stronger understanding of each other's perspectives. And we're working through that. And, it, and uh, it, it continues to be a strong focus for Contra Costa Water. So that's one area of re-emphasis that I would say we've been working on. And another area that was a focus of mine, and we've done some of this, but I think all of us have seen this is, I call it marketing the value of water. Um, we've done a variety of surveys and focus groups through the years, and it's just surprisingly, it's in the 90% plus range of how little customers know about their water supply. I mean, for the, I'm, I'm not really kidding. I think many have seen this kind of data. We ask the question, where does your water come from? And in the 90% range, we get answers from the faucet or from a pipeline. Um, and so you know, when we talk about needing to invest in our infrastructure and asking the ratepayers to put money back in their system to provide the reliability for this generation and future generations, they need to know why, and to know why, they have to understand the value of water. So it's another area that we're focusing on uh, is treating that education process as a marketing effort as, as a private firm might market services or products that we need to do the same type of thing. Customers don't know necessarily uh, what they need, and so we need to do a better job of educating them in that area. What's the one big thing I'd like to see us accomplish still? But we. I touched on it earlier. The, the biggest effort is the Los Vaqueros expansion and it will help all of us. It's going to provide access to, to the Delta to, uh, at certain times of the year that currently some of the partners in this project don't have. Uh, as importantly though, it provides a place to put that water um, that provides flexibility of when the water is taken, that provides flexibility in other types of projects. Gary earlier mentioned desalination, but desalination, recycled water, these kinds of potential water options start to get a little more realistic if we have ways to moving that water around through transfers mostly, but it's real water that will be moving. So that's a, a, a strong one big thing focus for Contra Costa Water is implementing that. And I'm happy to note that uh, very recently, all the partners of the project have agreed to form a joint power authority um, that we're moving forward to have start meeting and, and to continue this project forward. Um, so for Contra Costa Water, those are the key areas of focus right now. Okay, great, Steve. Uh, so now on to my uh, next question, and I do see some impossible questions are showing up in chat. I can see some of our guests are trying to top each other in the most thorny question imaginable, and uh, we'll get to those in a little bit. Uh, you've all three touched on this a little bit, but if there's anything you'd like to uh, expand on or drill into some detail on, uh, what, are, what are the biggest challenges or opportunities facing your agency, uh, particularly looking out over the next five to 10 years? Is there anything you'd like to add to your introductory remarks and some of the excellent comments you made in the first couple questions? Uh, I'll, maybe we'll, I'll lead it off. We'll go in backward order this time. Maybe I don't know. Uh, so the biggest challenge, I mean, I, I highlight Los Vaqueros expansion. That's the biggest project this water district's ever designed and constructed, assuming that the JPA would like Contra Costa Water to continue to provide the leadership with that project. Uh, most of the facilities involved will be our facilities. So um, we would like to continue the leadership in there. And that will take five to 10 years for us to implement. But the next biggest challenge I'd say is what I hit on uh, at the end of my conversation, which is uh, emphasizing and educating our customers on the value of water so that they will support stronger financial plans that could mean rate increases uh, to renew our infrastructure. And, and the two key areas for Contra Costa Water that need to have uh, stronger investments is we have an open canal that conveys 99% of our water to the central part of this county, to all the industries. It's had at least two, to, actually it's had three very close calls in the last 20 years of being uh, taken out of service for a matter of days, possibly even weeks, which would mean a very limited water supply for the area. And I don't, I mean, I, I know that we all have major arteries in our system. This one's uh, coming to the end of its life. And so it needs to be renewed. And we're looking at that. We call it the canal modernization project. And the my preferred approach, uh, I'll be open about it, is putting that canal in a pipeline. We had a drowning just yesterday. We've had uh, 89 deaths in the canal in its lifetime. All of them would have been preventable with an enclosed canal. So um, 
there's that project as well as our treated water mains are, are um, right now on a replacement cycle. And I don't think we're um, out of order with many other agencies, but about a 600 year replacement cycle. So we need to do a little more investing there. So those are the biggest challenges I see in the next five to 10 years, water supply and reliability. I, I package that back in the Los Vaqueros project. Again, my predecessors and our boards did a great job of, of providing system flexibility for us. Um, that's not to say that the Delta is reliable as we see it's getting increasingly unreliable. So we have to continue to look at other areas of uh, supply for ourselves. But um, uh, because of the infrastructure, you know, supply is certainly something we need to continue to focus on. But in the next five to 10 years, I feel that we have a good plan. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. Anything you want to add, uh, Valerie? Sure. Thank you, Dan. Um, challenges, opportunities, I think they're flip side of the coin. So some of the challenges we have have to do with water supply reliability, but the opportunities are the various projects that we're involved in to better our water supply reliability. So partnering on the Los Vaqueros Reservoir expansion, Sites Reservoir, um, Delta Conveyance Project, Potable Reuse, Bay Area Regional Desal, those are real opportunities. Um, there'll be expensive projects. Uh, some of them are riskier than others, but they are opportunities to increase water supply reliability, not just for zone seven, but for the region in some instances, the state. And it's an opportunity to work with other agencies. Um, most of these projects are not go it alone projects. I mentioned potable reuse, that'd be a local project, but that would be done in conjunction with the retailers. Los Vaqueros, that's collaboration and, and um, coordination with the region and the sites reservoir is a statewide project. So real opportunities to work with other agencies and make some of these projects happen. Cool. Uh, anything to add Clifford? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, people touched on a lot of the challenges already. I, you know, I would say the three challenges are for us is, you know, infrastructure and climate change and affordability. Um, you know, from the infrastructure standpoint, you know, we're investing billions of dollars in our infrastructure um, and really have spent a great deal of time on you know, planning and making sure that we're focused on the highest priority projects. Um, but you know, it's still difficult to keep up and it's expensive. You know, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars upgrading um, our largest treatment plant. Uh, you know, Steve talked about, you know, we're partnering with them on Los Vaqueros to improve uh, water supply reliability. Um, and we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars to upgrade our pipelines. Um, from a climate change perspective, uh, you know, you know, we're seeing the extremes in the weather, you know, you know, this drought is, um, you know, just one example. Um, although kind of the, the biggest impacts are beyond the five to 10 year time frame, you know, we can't wait until 2050 or wait until 2100 um, to start working on that problem. So we have to start working on it within this five to 10 year time frame. Um, from an affordability standpoint, um, you know, I think the question is, you know, how do we do all this? How do we invest in our infrastructure? How do we address climate change um, and still make sure that those who live in disadvantaged communities can afford to pay for their water? Um, you know, and, and we can't do this. You know, we can't make water affordable at the expense of investing in our infrastructure or working to address on climate change. You know, that actually, that also would be just short-sighted. Um, so what we've done here at East Bay Mud, you know, we have the most generous customer assistance program in the state. Um, you know, we're working on eliminating water shutoffs um, and we're working also to help, you know, shape how future customer assistance programs um, will work at the federal level. Um, as far as opportunities, um, you know, I'm going to say this a lot today, but, you know, really, I think the greatest opportunity, and, and we've seen that working with Steve and working with Valerie, again, is that collaboration. Um, and there's also great opportunities with innovation. Um, and I, I'll just kind of echo a lot, I think, what I heard Valerie talk about. Um, I think communications is a, a really a good opportunity for all of us. Um, you know, we did some focus groups, you know, to see how we can get more people interested uh, in water. And, you know, it's interesting, Steve, talking about, you know, when you people ask, when you ask people, you know, where does your water come from? And a lot of people say from their tap. Uh, and if we dig down, you know, you know, not that I have anything against San Francisco, but when you ask where does East Bay Muds water come from, those people who don't say their tap, a lot of them say Hachechi, um, you know, so, you know, we, we try to, you know, correct that, but, you know, we have tended in the past to either stay under the radar, I think, as Valerie said, um, or when we want to talk about what we want to do, we want to talk about our infrastructure, we want to talk about water quality, and we did some focus groups, 
Um, that's not what people want to hear. Um, they want to hear about our history. They want to hear about how we're investing in the future. They want to hear about our work helping the environment. Um, so the question is, how can we change how we communicate and talk about our history, talk about how we invest in our infrastructure, talk about the environment. And once we get them interested, then we can talk about all the other things that we want to tell them about. Um, so I think that communication piece, and you know, Valerie's mentioned this a couple of times, I think that's really a great opportunity uh, for utilities going forward. That's really fascinating, Clifford, to kind of hear uh, what your uh, focus groups came up with and, and kind of their, their difference on what they think is important to them versus what we want them uh, to be focused on. So, so thanks for sharing that. Uh, so a couple of you touched on my next question, but, but let's go ahead and drill into it in a little bit of detail. Uh, what do you see for the future of collaborations among the East Bay Water Agencies, not only amongst your three, but there's other, you know, uh, smaller agencies out there. What are your thoughts on, uh, on some collaborations uh, amongst the agencies in the future? I'll just say I'd like to, we have the, the other two here are partners in our project, so I'd like to hear from them first. I, I can jump in real quick, Steve. I mean, it's, you know, besides, you know, Los Vaqueros, um, you know, I, I think the, the future of collaboration, you know, and, you know, I, I've said this many times, I mean, that is how we're going to solve our biggest problems. Los Vaqueros is a great example. But, you know, just some other examples, and, you know, we've worked with uh, Contra Costa on this, and, and this is related to innovation. You know, when we're looking at how can we um, find leaks faster in our system, we work with Contra Costa Water District. We work with the vendor to develop an entirely new product that's on the market today. Um, we work with vendors to de develop other types of loggers that will help the industry. Um, we've worked on machine learning. You know, you, know, we, you, know, you think about how much time we spent to, how can we optimize how we plan, design, and construct pipeline projects? Um, we work with a vendor to develop a machine learning algorithm to say, well, you can only squeeze so much optimization out of, or so much efficiency out of design, planning, and, and construction. Now, how can we make sure that we're picking the right pipe, making sure that we pick the best pipe to replace? Um, and you know, we can only do this by collaborating. And so I, I think you know, we've all recognized that our problems are too big to solve on our own. And um, I think that collaboration with Steve, with Valerie, with other water agencies, um, it's only getting better and better. I would echo what Clifford has to say. We do collaborate regularly, and we know that we need to keep collaborating on the infrastructure projects. Also want to say the collaboration during COVID has been exceptional. Um, as water agencies, like we know how to deal with droughts. This one's a little worse than others, but we know what the toolbox is. We know how to deal with wildfires, but COVID was brand new. It was brand new for the entire world, and we were making it up as we go. And it was very helpful to constantly have roundtables with you know Bay Area regional Bay Area water agencies and just you know, this is what I'm doing at my agency. What do you think? And just that sort of collaboration. Um, so I, I can't I can't say enough about that. It seems so behind the scenes, but when you're making it up every day as you go, it's helpful to be able to talk to your uh, your partner water agencies. And again, Los Vaqueros, we're very interested in this project. We're, we're very happy to be collaborating with the Bay Area agencies on this and other projects. I think the Bay Area Regional Desal, that's a, more in the conceptual phase right now, but that will definitely be a Bay Area Regional project that would only work if there was extensive collaboration. Thanks, both of you, for that input. So I'd like to say for those that are listening, I mean, our water agencies have been collaborating for a very long time, for several decades, and there's been several uh, efforts that are continuing today that were set uh, over 20 years ago to ensure collaboration. I think Loma Prieta, that earthquake kind of instigated a, a stronger focus at that time in, in the early 1990s to work on collaborating uh, with Interties. So that for those customers out there to know that we do have the ability for emergency response to intertie with each other. And then that kind of instigated emergency response planning, which interestingly never really thought, at least for Contra Costa water, very much about a pandemic, but it thought a lot about earthquakes and, and fires and a variety of other hazards. And uh, agencies such as the Bay Area Water Agencies Coalition, BayWAC, ACUA, California Urban Water Agencies, these agencies, as well as some ad hoc groups 
Uh, Clifford and I have been meeting for a long time, at least 10 years. Uh, as, as another group, there have been a variety of ad hoc groups that have met through that time frame to collaborate. Um, I saw a note there about recycle water reuse, and that's another area of potential strong future collaboration, but we have collaborated there in the past, all of us, either, uh, for example, in East Bay Mud's case, where they actually also create and distribute recycled water, but we work with our neighboring uh, wastewater agencies to, to add that into the portfolio as well. It's, it's a potential, uh, well, it is a tool that can be used and needs to, and is planned for. Um, so moving forward, um, collaborating on projects like we're doing so we can leverage each other's assets, assets that maybe aren't utilized all the time that if we could uh, have them intertied with each other that they could be better utilized looking at other supply options where we can partner together to either do transfers or, or projects together that we invest in to provide some supply reliability, recycle water reuse, desalination. There's a variety of future collaborations and we're already planning on those things uh, and, and have mechanisms in place to continue moving those projects forward. So uh, that's what I see. The future collaborations for the Bay Area are essential to us meeting the needs of this area. Excellent, exciting stuff. I, I'm looking forward to the future, hearing about uh, how we've already been collaborating and, and, and what's more on the horizon. So let me uh, ask a, a bottom line, long-term question for our panelists. Um, is the East Bay gonna be okay on water reliable, reliable uh, or reliable water supply a decade from now? Where, you know, where are we going to be a decade from now? Are, are we in a downward spiral? Are we going to partially mitigate the current challenges? Are we going to get uh, totally on top of those challenges? Share your thoughts about where we're going to be and how successful we're going to be 10 years from now. Are we okay on water supply? I can start. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, um, the, you know, for the next 10 years, uh, the, you know, the short answer is yes. Um, we're going to be okay. You know, we've planned our water supply, um, you know, as part of our water supply management program, we've planned for extended droughts. Um, we've diversified our water portfolio, um, and that helps us weather through these types of droughts. Um, and, you know, and our customers are reducing our water use, and that's part of the solution. Um, but, you know, looking beyond 10 years, you know, and, you know, maybe first looking back 100 years ago, you know, when our founders built Party Reservoir, you know, they had great vision. Um, and for the last century, you know, water has been relatively inexpensive. We have to now plan for that next century. How do we continue to provide that reliable water supply, maintain the water quality, and still keep water affordable? And that's what you're hearing, you know, with Steve and Valerie and, you know, others talking about of how do we move forward and look at things like recycled water, look at desalination, and how do we do that um, by working with other agencies to make it happen? Yeah. Oh, Valerie, did you want to go? Uh, either way, you can go, Steve. Okay, you, uh, all right. Um, yeah, I also will answer yes, but I mean, global warming is definitely a, a question mark that, boy, the, this year's last uh, dry season, it was supposed to be a wet season, really raised a lot of questions for me in my mind about do we really have a handle on, on the severity and the frequency of droughts in this area? Uh, and to me, it just raises a question mark. Looking at the past might not be a good uh, uh, area to look at for developing the statistics for that. But that all said, yeah, within the 10 years for Contra Costa Water District and for the Bay Area, I think again, because of some of the collaboration that we do, I think we are okay. Um, we need to continue to build the tools to put in place to make sure we stay ahead of that. And I think we have those mechanisms in place uh, to continue to do that using some of the areas that we've talked about here. So. Uh, I think we're okay uh, for water supply in the next 10 years, but uh, beyond that, uh, it's, I, I think it's quite certain that we have to do a lot more um, to bring that reliability there for future generations. And I'll echo what uh, Clifford and Steve said. I think the answer for the next 10 years is yes, and I will echo what Steve said. Climate change might be a game changer, though. What we're seeing now is unprecedented, so we may have to rethink what we know uh, in the, the mid to long-term future. But yes, we have reliable water supply now. We have plans to maintain reliability through the next 10 years. 
And, you know, I, I know for like the zone seven water agency, we're positioned for, you know, storing water in wet years and taking that water out of storage in dry years. But sometimes in years like this, when it's extreme drought conditions, we do have to request additional conservation, but that's the difference between short-term and long-term. Um, but yes, I think with the projects we're working on, the collaboration we're doing, we do have reliable water for the next 10 years. Okay, now I'd like to uh, bounce back uh, to short term, uh, based on a question in the chat. I'm going to frame it a little bit. Um, so we had a couple of drought years so far. What if we have two more years like the last two have been? Uh, what does that look like uh, in your service area? How how are we going to manage? How how bad is it going to be? Uh, what extraordinary measures? might you have to take uh, over the next two years if, if 2022 and 2023 are the same as 19 and, and 20, or 20 and 21? Well, I can start, Dan. I think that if we continue to have multiple dry years, we will have to request additional conservation from our, our customers. As you know, Zone 7 declared a drought emergency and is um, mandating 15% conservation. And I think for the retailers, that's largely three days a week of outdoor irrigation during the summer and one day during the winter. Uh, for Zone 7, we're using our groundwater basin at the rate we're going. We have three more years of, of pumping at that rate. Um, but if things continue to get worse, I think you'd see more extreme conservation measures, you know, watering outdoors one day a week or no outdoor irrigation. Um, but in ex you know, multiple years of extreme drought, those would be the tools that we would be using to get through the drought. The other panelists want to hit on that? Yeah, I mean, our, our, our long-term, our water supply planning, you know, is based around, a, you know, three-year drought, you know, the 76, 77 drought, which, you know, many of us probably remember, as well as an additional third year. So, you know, a three-year drought planning um, um, uh, period, planning cycle. Um, and, you know, and as Valerie said, I mean, it's going to require our customers to, to cut back more. We're at 10% voluntary, but if we get into the third year of the drought, it's going to get to mandatory rationing, there's going to be restrictions, um, and that number is going to increase. Um, you know, our plan says that we will go up to 15%, um, but we'll have to see um, how conditions change. Um, but we put a lot of you know pieces in place. I mean, we've invested a half a billion dollars in our Freeport facility to improve our water supply reliability. Um, so you know, those are pieces that we have now that we didn't have back in '76 and '77. Yeah, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, in the next two years, uh, you know, we should be okay, but I will have to say that, again, depending upon what happens this winter, uh, we might have to consider some stronger conservation measures than we've implemented this year. Um, it's our customers are responding to what we have in place right now to a degree, but uh, we're going to need our customers to, res to respond a little more stringently and probably a little stronger conservation measures uh, if we have another dry year as dry as last year. Uh, that all said, with, with Los Vaqueros and the current storage level, as well as our anticipated even worst case water allocations, we believe the next two years we have a reliable water supply. Great, thanks, Steve. Um, so I'm picking up a couple of questions and framing them out of chat, but if anybody wants to hit a question verbally, if you'd use the raise the hand feature and, and our, uh, our facilitator on this, Mark Arcut, uh, he can recognize you, but let me keep framing some of the chat questions. Um, so conservation, let's delve into conservation a little bit. Um, so we're all working on conservation for the upcoming, uh, you know, the, the drought that we're in and might get a little worse. But what about conservation as a structural issue? What about being even more aggressive on conservation? And how does that balance with uh, increased investment in infrastructure for water supply and reliability? Uh, are, are, are we, you know, to, to, to be pointed, uh, are we thinking too much about structural and infrastructure uh, improvements for long-term reliability and not putting enough on the conservation side of the equation? What are your thoughts uh, on that? I'll start uh, since I haven't started in a few questions. Um, 
No, I don't. I mean, we at Contra Costa Water District, we have a very strong conservation program in a variety of areas, and we believe we can uh, always do more there. And I think all you have to do is drive around and look at the outside landscaping, which is a big portion of residential and, and urban water use, I should say. Uh, and you see that there's some more room there. That all said, it, what always needs to be remember, re what I always need to remind folks is conservation. Uh, if you're going to count on it, hardens your, your you know, your, your demand portfolio, your demands for the future. So we need to remember that, but um, we can do more in conservation and we will. And, um, and we do balance that with the other infrastructure needs for sure. Conservation is something where we've seen uh, gets pretty quick response and strong response. Our customers respond to conservation measures. And so um, it, it's a good investment and it's probably one of the lowest cost sources of water supply. Oh, I can address conservation. I'll, I'll use the overused phrase, it's a tool in the toolbox, but for zone seven, you know, for our build out demands, we will need more than one tool in the toolbox. So it is infrastructure projects and it is conservation. We've had permanent conservation since the 2013 drought. So we are conserving. Um, we expect after you know, this next drought, we'll see some more permanent conservation. Um, we, we do offer turf replacement programs. We recently increased our rebate amounts and tried to get the word out to the customer. So yes, conservation is something that is, is necessary and we will continue to work on it, but it's, it's not the only tool that we can use. And maybe I'll just add on top of that. I mean, you know, at East Bay, we've been investing in conservation for decades and you know our customers are using less water today per capita than they were in the 70s and you know i think that's similar for some other agencies as well i mean you know they've achieved you know 40 plus million gallons per day of savings and and we have a goal to add another 30 million gallons um, per day plus um to that by 2050. um you know but and, and maybe i'm not sure exactly where the question dan is coming from but you know we need to invest all of us need to invest more in conservation we can do more but we still have to invest in our infrastructure. We still have to invest in water supply. You know, whether they're using, you know, you know, 200 you know, gallons per day as a home or, you know, 150, we still need the pipes. We still need the treatment plants. We still need all the infrastructure in place. So we can't do any of this at the expense of the other. Cool, cool. I, I wanted to touch on uh, one question. Uh, you know, there's a comment about, you know, central sand is discharging a lot of wastewater out into the river and you know what could be done with that resource and i just wanted to share there's a you know a partnership between central sand and east bay mud and my agency dsrsd a pilot project where we're actually diverting some wastewater flow from the upper areas of central sands collection system down to the dsrsd wastewater plant we're recycling it here at dsrsd and ultimately that water a lot of that water is ending up in east bay mud service area for for recycling so that's a little pilot project, uh, you know, maybe maybe that offers opportunities and lessons learned for other things. But, you know, I bet we're probably over 20 or 30 million gallons this year uh, that we were able to use um, to help uh, in the East Bay Mud and DSRSD service area. So so there's a good pilot project on uh, on that. Let me see. Um, I want to add just one extra clarification on that comment, Dan, is, you know, the discharge water from Central Sand, we also are working with them on, on a project that would uh, uh, be leveraged by Los Vaqueros, but the water that's discharged is providing a, a benefit to, it's a, providing a water quality benefit, which provides a water supply benefit. If that water isn't being discharged, at least in the amounts that it is now, you know, down in, at the point in the river that it is, uh, more water from upstream has to replace it to some degree. Now it does provide, um, it, it gets a little complicated with the water modeling because it depends on the timing of these things, but it does provide a benefit. It's not just going to out into the ocean and, and as a waste, it, it's holding the salt back. That's a good point. I mean, discharge to the river is discharged from the bay or to the ocean and, and, and there is that additional benefit. So uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, so we have uh, Harold, uh, who's a regular on our Water and Environment Task Force and was a former, uh, I think, Contra Costa grand juror. 
And he says, what about collaborations uh, with wastewater treaters, uh, you know, wastewater plants and so on, things like potable reuse. Anybody want to touch on that? Yeah, I mean, hey, Dan. Know, if they mud, oh, go ahead, Valerie. Oh, go ahead, Clifford. Yeah, I'll just uh, say, I mean, if they mud, you know, we are recycling about, uh, recycled water is about 9 million gallons per day. Our goal is to get to 20 million gallons per day. Um, and, you know, that includes, um, you know, looking at, you know, the wastewater plants and what they produce. Um, you know, if you think about, you know, we all talked about the impact of climate change. I mean, for every degree Celsius rise in the air temperature, that snow line moves up 500 feet. You know, the top of the McCulmey watershed is at 8,000 feet. So, you know, there's going to be a point in the future that, you know, that Part D supply that was so reliable in the past is not going to be as reliable. So we're going to have to look at these new sources, and it could be from, you know, the wastewater plants or others. Um, that's going to be, you know, part of our portfolio. That, that is, you know, as Valerie and Steve talked about, you know, that's going to be a game changer for all of us. And Dan, you could probably talk about potable reuse in the Tri-Valley better than I could. Um, but for the Tri-Valley, the, the retailers do recycle water for irrigation, and they've been very successful at that. Um, and, you know, in case of Dublin San Ramon Services District, uh, there is a moratorium on new connections in the summer. Um, but we are the, the Tri-Valley Water Agencies. We are in the study phase on potable, potable reuse for that last increment of, you know, wastewater. There was a feasibility study that was completed about four years ago, and it said that it was a feasible solution, and there were five options, and now we're in the study phase on um, groundwater, how groundwater injection would work um, and other groundwater studies. So we are looking at that in the Tri-Valley area. Okay, great question, uh, Harold. I owe you 20 bucks. Thanks for that one. Uh, so we have another interesting question here. Uh, the Bay Area Clean Water Agencies are leading the Bay Area Regional Reliability stu Studies published back in 2018. Uh, while some progress has been made, COVID has slowed the progress. How important do you think this effort that's known by its acronym of BAR, B-A-R-R, how important do you think this effort is and does your agency feel it is a priority to resource these efforts uh, and move the initiatives forward? Yeah, the three of us are involved in that, and it's very important to keep moving it forward and resource it. And uh, we have projects that are in play right this year with this drought that uh, are projects listed in the in the bar studies that have been done in the past. So, um, yes, we need to continue that. I agree wholeheartedly. I'm here. Okay, uh, so I've got a, a question from Bob Whitley. So Bob Whitley's a great guy. And uh, he always asks these like really deep, broad questions. And I'm like, dude, you graduated from Cal 50 years ago. Don't you have the answer to your own question? But Bob doesn't. So here it is. Uh, so it seems like, uh, you know, housing in the state is this big long-term uh, issue we have to face. Uh, the governor and legislature are pushing forward various ideas. Uh, Bob's saying uh, he's reading it's, uh, you know, the state needs three and a half million more housing units in the next four years. Uh, you know, there's going to be some allocation of the East Bay. And, uh, you know, Bob's wondering, you know, how does water supply versus the pressure for housing demands, how do those interplay? How are the water agencies going to deal with that? Do they see water supply as like a glass ceiling on that other dimension? Of, of housing demand. Maybe I'll jump in this one first. I mean, you know, when we look at, you know, the housing, I mean, you know, this, this housing isn't, you know, these ideas of housing isn't being developed independently of our water supply planning. So when we look at our water supply plan, we meet with all the cities, we meet with all the counties and look at what are your projections for how much housing you're gonna have. And, and we try to we match that up with what we think our water supply needs are. And that's how we get to our projections of, you know, you know how much additional conservation do we need to achieve? How much additional recycled water do we need? Um, how do we make sure that the other parts that we have are still reliable? You know, in wet years, it's really not a problem. It's in the dry years that it starts becoming an issue. So we look at, and then what component of that toolbox that, you know, Valerie has been talking about a lot, what component of that toolbox includes water conservation? So when we do our water supply planning, 
we look at all those projections of housing units and, and where the growth is gonna be and what type of growth. Is it gonna be infill? Is it gonna be multifamily? Is it gonna be single family? Is it gonna be high density or not? All that gets factored into our long-term planning. Cool. Yeah, similar answer for zone seven. Um, you know, we, we are not a land use planning agency. Um, we get, you know, the, the housing and build out plans from, you know, the cities and the retailers. And we put that into our urban water management plan, our, our long-term planning efforts. Um, as far as, you know, the increased housing amounts the state's looking for and long-term water supply. Um, I think as we get through this drought, we'll, we'll see if there's going to be any changes from the state and our requirements for our 2025 urban water management plans. Um, but for now, the program works. Ditto for CCWD. All right. Um, so one of our, uh, one of our uh, viewers uh, wants to explore one of the issues in greater detail, uh, responding to Clifford's comment about uh, the best and brightest in the workforce and how do we get the best and brightest uh, in our workforces and particularly in apprenticeship programs. Do, do you folks have ideas or experiences on uh, uh, meeting that challenge of getting the best and brightest into the water industry? Well, maybe since the question was initially directed at me, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I, I think, you know, getting the best and the brightest, I mean, it's, it's definitely a, a multi-pronged approach. I mean, the, the first thing is, you know, as utilities, you know, we have to move towards and be more innovative. And, and you know, the, the example I've used in the past is, um, you know, my dad, you know, he loved typewriters. Um, he had a rotary phone on his desk. But if you can imagine, if, if you have a new employee and they walk into your business and they see typewriters and rotary phones and nothing else, they're going to walk away. And the only people that you're going to attract are the people who like typewriters and rotary phones. And the analogy is here is because, you know, we walk into some of our facilities, and, and I'm not saying East Bay Mud facilities, but the water industry in general, you go into some of these facilities and you're looking at facilities that look like they're from the early 19th century. They're, they look like they're the rotary phones and and the typewriters. So you can't attract the people that you want, the best and the brightest who wanna be innovative, who wanna change things, unless first you start as an organization to be more innovative. More specifically, the question about apprenticeship programs, you know, at East Bay Mud, you know, we have an apprenticeship program for plumbers. We have apprenticeship program for maintenance trades. And we're, we're looking at ways that, you know, we, you know, and people can come in with no experience whatsoever and eventually work up within you know, three to five years to become journey level and make a very good living working in the water industry. Um, but we're looking at how can we expand? How can we reach out to more groups? How can we kind of um, clarify the whole process of how do you apply at East Bay Mud or any of these agencies? Because it could be somewhat confusing. How can we simplify that whole process so people can come in um, and uh, you know, start as an apprentice and, and grow with the organization. That also works besides the trades. You know, we also want people to come in in the technical areas from the engineering standpoint. We want people to come in to be rangers at East Bay Mud. And so we have programs to bring in ranger interns that can work out to become a ranger here at East Bay Mud. So we're looking across all of our classifications and reaching out to different groups, reaching out to different um, apprenticeship programs outside of East Bay Mud to say, hey, we have great jobs here and you can come in with little to no experience and at the end of you know, your apprenticeship program, you will be a journey level um, uh, employee and you will make a very good living uh, in what you do here at East Bay Mud. Okay. Other two panelists, okay. you chime in? Yeah, I'd like to chime in that, you know, a, a key area, I talked about it earlier this morning is diversity and inclusion efforts, you know, uh, building on, Clifford's uh, analogy there of the rotary phone and the typewriter, when people come in and see more people that are like them, uh, feel welcoming and feel like they'll belong in that organization, that now opened the door to a whole new area of potential workers. And so I think that that's a very important area that we can all get great benefit from. Uh, there's an agency that, or an organization, a new organization that's starting up the California African American Water Education Foundation and their key focus is to get into African-American communities, communities of color, and introduce those communities to the water business. If you look at the statistics of uh, uh, African-American and Latino uh, and Latina 
um, uh, members of the water industry. That's not a very large number. They're not in, not uh, representative of the numbers that are in other areas of work for those groups. And so there's great opportunity there. And so uh, there and working with the unions, they have a variety of apprentice programs. And, and that's another area that I think we can strengthen and leverage. So uh, those are some of the things to think about. I would just add that, you know, Zone Seven's had a very successful intern program, which we've used in the past. And it's not just for college interns or engineering, we've used it for operations and maintenance as well. Um, it's been on hold the last few years because of COVID and not wanting to bring in a lot of new people into the, the workplace. But um, we will be looking forward to ramping that up and, and trying to get young people interested in water and flood and, you know, maybe look for permanent jobs in our industry. Hey, one question I've had in my back pocket I want to throw out there. Uh, is there is there anything that the panel uh, would ask of, of us here at the East Bay Leadership Council that we can do to support your respective agencies and missions? I mean, you have a lot of people, uh, people in the business, elected official, uh, interested citizens. Are there folks, uh, are, do you folks have things that, uh, that that you'd like East Bay Leadership Council, uh, you know, kind of a business supporting uh, advocacy group to help you out? Dan, I would just say continue, continue what's been done in the past, um, the education, the advocacy, and the collaboration. I think it's very helpful for our efforts. Yeah, on top of that, I mean, you know, help kind of share the message. I mean, this is this is really an exciting time to be in the water industry. So, um, you know, this is a great place to be. And, you know, and if you really care about the environment, if you really care about public health, and if you really care about the community, um, this is a career you should be looking for. Yes, definitely. Uh, meetings like today are important. Get your get educated on these topics. And then when you have opportunities to speak to others about it, you can do the same. So spreading knowledge of our what we're doing, our needs, the challenges, and how we're working to meet them. Yeah, I hope some of our viewers, we have a higher number of viewers on water issues than we typically do on water issues. So we do both water and environment here on this task force. I hope some of you are finding this interesting and you might pass the word along to uh, some of your colleagues and friends and see if they can uh, listen in because we do this, uh, you know, every month, 11 months out of the year on water issues and environment issues. And we have a lot of cool ideas and I appreciate uh, what the panel's doing. Uh, another interesting question is uh, what about the balance? And this is, you know, kind of a statewide issue. Uh, and this will be a great question for us to save or, or to carry over with Joaquin Esco uh, Escobel uh, next month. Um, 80% of the state's water is used uh, in ag, you know, in the Central Valley and other places. And, you know, the rest is municipal and industrial uses that are the primary customers uh, of the agencies speaking today. Uh, do you see any change in that uh, proportion of water between the ag users and the municipal and industrial users uh, in the state, you know, or for your agency? And I can answer for zone seven, I don't think we see any change. Um, our long-term plans for both our ag industry and our m and I, I think it's roughly the same proportion. Um, we'll see statewide. I think this drought will inform a lot of, of the future. Okay. I'll tap on the industry area. I do see some changes. I see some industries, maybe one leaving, which is going to free some water supply, uh, and at the least, they're also focusing on ways to use less water, so that also helps. Um, yeah, so I'll comment there. Okay, and then uh, the last question is, uh, so we've seen in some recent years, there's actually been a kind of a new trend of uh, more folks leaving California than being born or coming to California does anybody see that as a trend? Does that have any implications for taking water supply stress off your agencies 
or changing the economics of your agencies? Do you, do you see that as an issue? Yeah, we, we certainly, I mean, we've heard a lot about these trends, you know, and if I just gauge it by how much building activity there is in Bay Mud, uh, you know, people are talking about, you know, people are leaving the Bay Area, but, you know, we've seen more construction going on in the last 18 months than we've seen, you know, in, you know, many of the prior years. So um, if it's happening, you know, people, we're, you know, people are still building and people are still moving into our service area. Ditto for zone seven. Same thing. All righty. So I'd like to, uh, to thank our panelists, express our appreciation. Uh, I was very tough on them. There was, you know, it's tough to schedule this and to, and to get three general managers from three big important agencies together at the same time, but we finally uh, were able to swing that. And I appreciate a lot of flexibility from our panelists in moving their schedules around to get here on the same day. So thank you, Valerie, Steve, and uh, Clifford. I do know that uh, the East Bay Leadership Council is now taping these task force uh, presentations. I think today's panel discussion was really great. There's just a lot to learn. And I know I was taking notes and going, oh, I missed that. Oh, I missed that. There's more things I have to worry about that I wasn't even thinking about. Um, so the East Bay Leadership Council does post this. Uh, I think they're showing these videos or posting them uh on the east bay leadership council webpage is that right either mark or christine are we posting these now on that's right yeah you can uh, subscribe to our newsletter on our website and you can get them as soon as they're posted you can also subscribe to our youtube channel as a way of uh getting those notifications as soon as the video is up but i hope a lot of you have found this as interesting as me and uh and if you have friends and colleagues we are like oh there was some cool stuff there uh, they really had a mother load of interesting information uh, if you could direct them uh, and, and uh, you know, they can watch not live, but they can at least see some of our conversation. And I hope you'll all pass the word on uh, future uh, monthly uh, meetings. So that's all I have as the moderator. Is there anything any of the other co-chairs have to say? Yeah, Dan, this, this is Gary. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Dan, for, for being the moderator, you've got a good skill at that. So when you're tired of being a general, a general manager, you can go on the circuit as a moderator. I, I also noticed in the audience, several board members, and I really appreciate because today, I mean, you, you see the energy and the, the vision of our, our leaders in, the, in our East Bay leadership area related to water. And I really stand behind that. But uh, thank you for attending like uh, board members like Ernie Avila, Barbara Hockett, and Premier Betty Boatman and Lisa Borber. And, and if I've forgotten anybody, please quickly raise your hand so we can recognize you. And of course, having what I view as the, the best and strongest water attorney in the state of California, Bob Maddow, is, is also online. So next month is, a, that's a big meeting for us. Please note that we're not having it on the normal Tuesday, but we're having it on a, the Monday before. So Monday, the October 18th, put that on your calendars for Joaquin Escoval, the, the chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. Normally, we never change our times for our meetings, but in this case, in order to get Joaquin at all, uh, he is, you know, his, his time is just so tied up. Um, when we announce that, you'll see the announcement coming out. We will encourage you to submit questions so that we can feed that to him and he can tailor his, his uh, presentation to us. Uh, so I encourage you to do that. And finally, from my standpoint, up here at the cabin, just remember that it is five o'clock somewhere. So great meeting, guys. Thank you.